Welcome back, hockey fans. This is episode 114 of ClapperCast Hockey Podcast. My name is Sean, and I'm hosting this week's episode. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone to make sure you check out our website, ClapperCast.com, to find all of our content, blog posts included. We've recently put up posts on Connor McDavid's tone-deaf press conference and some mid-season Vesna candidates, for example. Also, make sure you follow us on social media, Facebook and Instagram at ClapperCast Media, and on Twitter at ClapperCast. There, you'll find more content updates, the occasional meme, and some hockey news and updates throughout the week. To start out this week's episode, I just have a couple of quick bits here to pass along of just things that have happened over the past week or two. Um, First off, the Florida Panthers just went through this stretch where they scored 54 goals in nine games. Six goals per game. That's just a historic level of offense. Uh, If I remember correctly, the graphic that I saw, this, this level of offense, that level of scoring has not been done since the 1990s. The Penguins and Red Wings teams of the 90s, of the early to mid-90s, were the last to have comparable levels of offense over a nine-game stretch. That streak is done as of tonight, as Florida lost 5-1 to to Calgary. So we can consider that particular stretch done, but it does show just how good this Florida Panthers team is and just how legitimate they are of contenders. And I kind of go back to past couple of episodes where we've talked about um, a couple of potential trade candidates for the Panthers that this could be the year that they want to go all in. So again, if they're going to be doing this type of thing where they scored that many goals per game, including where they beat the back-to-back champions, Tampa Bay Lightning, like nine to two or nine to three in one of those games. So this is showing that they are ready to compete. And maybe this is the year that they choose to go all in, try and buy a, buy a rental, a high profile rental to help push them over the top. Next up, the Montreal Canadiens have hired their new general manager. They've hired Kent Hughes, uh, he's just now a former player agent. He typically represented Quebec-born or Quebec NHL players like Patrice Bergeron. Um, this I see is a bit of an interesting direction. They're taking someone who isn't a part of the normal development or recycling curve that executives usually follow. Um, a lot of times you see guys who have been scouts or assistant GMs for years and years and years before they get a shot at a actual GM position. But um, Kent Hughes has been a player agent for the last 25 years. So don't get me wrong, his, his background absolutely puts him in a position where he can switch over he's basically switching over to the other side of what he used to do so he's been a part of these negotiations he's been a part of the acquisition and and trading process so he knows what's going on Um, it's just a, a an interesting different direction for for someone to take to get to a gm position um i imagine this particular situation for hughes will be something like what we kind of discussed on here back when this hiring process started where Jeff Gorton, the VP of Hockey Ops for the Montreal Canadiens now, um, he's going to be very involved in this role, and the Hughes hiring is more to satisfy the bilingual criteria on HAB staff. So this isn't necessarily a bad thing, as Jeff Gorton has a great track record as the interim GM in Boston for a bit, and also of building the core of the current Rangers team that's doing so well this season. Um, this also gives Kent Hughes a chance to learn and actually shadow someone for a bit. So we've got the trade deadline coming up in about a month and a bit here. So we'll get a chance to kind of see what direction the Montreal Canadiens are going to take. And we're going to get to see um, maybe the start of what type of plan that uh, Gorton and Hughes are going to be implementing on the Habs over the next few seasons. Over the last little bit, I've talked about the Vesna Trophy. So I'm going to continue with the midseason award theme and switch over to the Calder Trophy for a minute here. Uh, Because there's someone who he's only just starting to get recognition for this award, but he definitely deserves more of it. And that's going to be Tanner Janot, the Nashville Predators winger. So he's currently 24 years old, undrafted winger, and he had seven points in 15 games last season in his first appearances in the NHL. But for this season, his official rookie season, he's now at 24 points in 40 games this season. So he's sitting fourth in rookie scoring as of when I'm recording this, behind only Lucas Raymond, Trevor Zegras, and Moritz Sider. So those three are going to be the de facto trio that lead in Calder voting. But I'm here to tell you that Geno should be in this conversation. He should be right up there with Raymond and Zegris in terms of forwards and contention for the Calder Trophy. So what Geno has over the rest of these candidates is that he is currently leading the league in rookie goal scoring. He's passed Lucas Raymond uh, within the last few games here, and he's now got the most goals out of all of the rookies. Um, and Tanner Geno, just despite having less points, he does play a fair amount less per game. He plays about two minutes less than Raymond and Zegris. Geno also has very little power play time. He only gets about 22 seconds per game compared to the two or three minutes for the others. And te- the other thing Geno has over the other forwards is that he spends over two minutes per game on the penalty kill. He is one of Nashville's go-to forwards on the PK, which Raymond and Zegris don't play any penalty kill. It's just Sider who has about a minute and a half of uh, PK time per game. So Geno even has more than than Sider. And these factors will affect the point total ultimately. 
Um, if you're not playing power play, if you're not getting top line minutes and you're playing more time on the penalty kill, you're not going to have quite as many points. So there's, you know, an argument to kind of show that where, you know, say Geno were to get top line minutes or a bunch of power play time on the top unit, uh, he might end up, you know, getting closer to Zegers and Raymond in points. Obviously, that's a hypothetical and you can't just give someone a trophy or give someone votes for a trophy based off of, oh, if he had gotten more ice time in this particular situation, he would have put up more points. But it's just kind of putting context this to the to the statistics. At this point, too, Tanner Genoa is also sort of like a modern day power forward type where he can skate, he brings energy, he hits, he scores, he fights. You know, he's currently the rookie leader in hits at 130 and he's fourth in the league overall in hits as well. So he's he's quite an incredibly versatile player this early in his career. Um, he doesn't get quite as much attention because he isn't as flashy as Raymond or Zegris. And he also plays in Nashville. And, you know, we kind of see the same thing going on with UC Saros and the Vesna, where the Nashville players just don't often get as much attention for the big awards. You know, Roman Yossi, of course, being someone who's recently won the Norris Trophy gets attention. But it's it's harder to break the barrier of of whether or not you get attention with those, you know, coming from a Nashville market. So the main message out of this segment vote Geno. I'm recording this on January 18th. So earlier today, Jim Matheson, uh, an Oilers reporter, and Leon Dreisaitl got into it in, in a media scrum. Um, Matheson was busy asking really testy questions and dumb ones like, are you, as, are you angry as well as frustrated with the way things are going? And did you think you guys were past six-game losing streaks after the way the last two seasons went? And this ended up culminating in a question where a very rambling Matheson first asks, what is the number one reason you guys are losing eventually? To which Dreisaitl visibly shakes his head, and then he eventually asks some form of, what do you guys need to work on right now? Dreisaitl answered with, we have to get better at everything. So in my view, that's a perfectly reasonable, albeit it's blunt and short response, but like, what else do you need someone to say in that situation? Really, like, the team sucks, the team's not winning, we have to do everything better to fix that. Um, Jim Matheson did not like this and replied, would you like to expand on that? The rest of the press conference and Matheson's other dumb questions had already kind of put Dreisaitl in a seemingly disinterested or dismissive mood from what it looks like on the on the podium anyways. So Dreisaitl responded, no, you can do that. You know everything. Uh, Matheson then decided to respond, why are you so pissy? So it's like, what the fuck here? A Hockey Hall of Fame media honoree gets this emotionally butthurt when someone doesn't answer a question in the way he likes. So you now have a 70-plus-year-old reporter asking another fully grown adult, why are you so pissy? So after this this other, the second question, Dreisaitl gave Matheson the chance to backtrack on this asinine question by making him repeat it, but Matheson just doubled down. So Leon responded, I'm not, I'm just answering your question. And even more butthurt, Matheson then says, you are pissy whenever I ask you a question, and Dreisaitl just says, I give you an answer. <laughs> So at this point, you can hear the temper tantrum and pouting in Matheson as he says it's not a very good one. <laughs> so at this point, for some reason, Matheson keeps going. Like, how many questions does this guy get in, in the media scrum anyways? And, and proceeds to ramble his way into asking, is it a good thing to show your frustrations on the ice so that other teams can see? And at this point, Dreisaitl's just smirking, and he's kind of rubs his head and says, yeah, it's a great thing for sure, and he kind of just pieces out after that. So, of course, immediately after this, all the, all the media, all his buddies in the media, Mark Spector mostly included, uh, start jumping to Matheson's defense on Twitter, calling Dreisaitl immature and rude. Uh, most of the fan response is like, what's going on? Like, why is Matheson acting this way? And I'm just going back to the to the boiling over point of this incident when Dreisaitl just responds, we need to get better at everything. What more do you need him to say? Do you really think Leon Dreisaitl is going to start calling out specific parts of the team that need improvement? He's not going to go up on that podium and say the goalies have to be better, the the defense has to be better, the forwards have to be better. He's going to say everything. He's not going to put his teammates under the bus like that. And moving over onto Jim Matheson, maybe try asking a straight question instead of rambling through three different versions of it before settling on one. Maybe try asking a question in a non-antagonistic way so that you aren't coming cr across as attacking the player. Like, of course, when you start asking shit like, did you think you were past six-game losing streaks? You're going to get short and blunt answers because the player is not going to be particularly happy about being asked that. And at this point, too, you're you're also the 70-year-old man who just asked another adult why they're so pissy and you're in a professional situation. And this is after he's been asking dumb shit like, are you angry as well as frustrated and aren't you better than six-game losing streaks? Now, devil's advocate for just a moment here. 
Drysaddle saying you do that, you know everything is sort of just asking for trouble. That's going to get an escalation out of someone because he's kind of giving the same antagonistic attitude back to Matheson. But this situation, combined with past incidents with Jim Matheson, such as over this past offseason when he asked Miko Koskinen, uh, all the su- all summer the fans wanted a different goaltender other than you. Are you upset by that? Like, what kind of a question is that to ask the team's backup goalie who's going to end up being a starter through the season? Like, oh, hey, the fan base hates you. What do you think about that? First off, this is just an incredibly sensationalized statement by Matheson, and it's just it's asking for trouble. Like, when you when you say to someone, oh, hey, everyone hates you. Are you mad by that? What type of answer are you hoping for out of that? What are you really trying to do here other than just get some really bad quote you can take out of context and get extra clicks and that's not even to mention what you're going to do to the to the player media relations for the team and the organization when you have a member of the media asking the player stuff like this like of course they're not going to want to talk to you and another press conference from early in 2021 when Matheson asked Ryan Nugent Hopkins a series of questions before a Battle of Alberta game like if Mike Smith isn't in net will the shenanigans go down a bit since Miko Koskinen isn't that type of player and that's in reference to an earlier battle of, battle of Alberta where Mike Smith got in a goalie fight. And again, like, what's with the shot at Miko Koskinen? Because the way it's worded just makes it sound like it's some sort of attack on his player type or him as a goalie or whatever. And another question he asked there, uh, talking about with no fans in the arena, when Edmonton plays Calgary, the rivalry can be sensed in the building with the fans wearing different jerseys. Do the players notice that even in the warm-up? I assume it's in relation to the different atmosphere at the time when there were no fans in the arena. And again, I just like, what type of a question is that? What type of answer do you think you're going to get out of that? And the ultimate icing on the cake question from that interview, uh, there won't be any more Nugent Hopkins Monaghan fights. That was a one-off to which Nugent Hopkins just kind of shakes his head, gives a deflated exhale and replies like, what do you want me to say, Jim? You know, this is in reference to Nugent Hopkins and Sean Monaghan getting into a fight in a previous game. And, uh, again it's you go back to that same question what type of answer do you think you're going to get out of that when you're just asking these these stupid questions to players like what's newton hopkins going to say to that no i'm not going to fight again or yeah i'm absolutely going to step on the ice and punch him in the side of the head or something like there's no real way to answer that in any sort of insightful or useful manner so what I kind of see here is that this is a reporter who has a history of acting rude, abrasive, and antagonistic to players, and proceeding to ask them dumb, asinine questions that are barely even questions worth an answer, never mind you know anything insightful that can be used in any sort of journalistic work. Players talk. They see, they hear what goes on, and who they like or dislike talking to in the media. This isn't just a one-time situation with a frustrated player sounding off between Dreisaitl and Matheson. It's a pattern with Jim Matheson to get these types of answers from players when he asks these stupid and insulting questions. Dreisaitl in this situation could have replied a bit differently and held his tongue on the you-know-everything comment. But at the same time, the guy asks three dumb questions before this and then gets mad when Dreisaitl doesn't write an entire story for him with his answer. Then he proceeds to ask why he's so pissy that he doesn't give elaborate answers to questions and then asks another dumb question about showing his frustrations on the ice. Like He's just asking for, for trouble in this, in this interaction. The entire situation is just a clusterfuck of emotion and frustration, but a reporter who's been covering the team for twice as long as Dreisaitl has even been alive, you'd think he would have more practice asking questions and more control over his emotions in a situation. I don't know what the situation's like behind the scenes, what the relationship is like between the Oilers, the players, and Matheson, or if after this after this ordeal today they've all gone and you know, made peace with each other. But I can't imagine at this point that you know, after all of these continual, you know, weird interviews with players that too many of the Oilers and too many of the league's players are going to be happy to talk to Jim Matheson if he's just going to ask them these probing, prodding questions like that. I'm not suggesting anything here because I ultimately do not want this coaching change to happen, but uh, I can't help but thinking in these moments what someone like John Tortorella would, would do with uh, with Jim Matheson. Maybe maybe more vintage torts. Maybe he's calmed down a bit now, I think, but... Uh, you know, vintage torts from 10, 15 years ago. Might be fun to have in, in a room with Jim Matheson for an interview. Moving on to another story from the past week. Um, we got to see the All-Star Game rosters released. Now, I'm not overly interested in, in it's or who goes. And, you know, I sound I know I sound extremely excited right now to even be talking about it. Like, the whole thing is barely interesting from a TV viewer's perspective. But that's an entirely different topic from the discussion that's been going on through the week here. 
the focal point of contention has been around the criteria that one player from each team has to go to the All-Star weekend. So in cases like this, we end up with guys like Drake Batherson, Dylan Larkin, and Nick Suzuki being named to the All-Star game over Brad Marchand and Steven Stamkos. Or Clayton Keller being named to the team over Nazem Kadri, who's like a top five scorer in the league this season. So that's not to say that the guys who are going are not stars or the best player on their team. They just might not be the best of the best in the league. And it is worth noting at this point that Stamkos and Kadri were named as the last man in fan vote, so they are going ultimately. They just weren't selected in the initial initial roster release. So this has ended up creating a situation where fans and players alike are really frustrated with that selection process and who goes to the All-Star Weekend, who gets to go. Um, Nathan McKinnon, of all people, being the prominent one with his quote, it's silly, I don't think every team should send a guy. It's an All-Star game, not a participation game. From the league's perspective, it makes sense that the NHL wants to send a player from each team. So it's like an actual league-wide event, and it gives fans of all teams incentive to tune in. If the rosters are all full of players from one or two teams, you know, the top division the top teams in the division usually, why would any Arizona or Montreal fans even bother tuning into the game or weekend if they don't get to see any of their players? They just get to see the, t- the players who beat up on their team all, the- all season long. So the league doesn't want to do something that's going to limit or push away some of their audience. But then again, this also brings up an entirely different topic again of the game and weekend being boring as hell anyway, so it's not like most fans even care. But ultimately, Nathan McKinnon is right. It's an all-star game, not a league celebration weekend. They market it as an all-star game, it should kind of be an all-star game. I think ultimately part of the problem is the format that they use now. With the 3v3, it sort of limits the amount of players that go. It might not be a whole lot less than the old format of East versus West teams compared to the team for each division that goes now, but you're still only sending 11 players total from eight teams where it's nine skaters and two goalies. There is not much room in there to accommodate getting all the best players or getting someone from each team. You kind of have to pick one pick one or the other you don't get to choose both in terms of all the best players or all the teams involved so within this reddit user chase gordon 24 points out that there is actually a bit of a case of not having enough roster spots for proper representation Uh, they point out that currently there is 1.3 all-stars per team compared to the 1988 all-star game having 1.9 and this is ultimately due to the league's expansion and adding more teams but the difference between players going to the 1988 All-Star Game and 2022 All-Star Game is only four more players, despite there being like 10 plus more teams since that year. To me, in in all of this, the simple solution is just going to be adding four or five more roster spots per team, and that's just going to give you that extra representation. You're playing 3v3 anyways, so the shifts are going to be short and the extra players could end up helping, and then this way you just have, you know, four forward lines and a few defenders you can cycle through instead of the same two guys the entire game. Uh, There's there's seven defenders going to the All-Star Game total. The Metro has three, the Atlantic has two, and the Central and Pacific have one each. So that really seems like a case where they need a couple extra roster spots so they can actually accommodate and get an appropriate amount of defenders out there. And what that ends up doing, you you know, you have five extra roster spots to send, so you add two or three defenders to each roster, then you still have two or three more forwards to send. And at that point, you basically covered all of the players who are in the, you know, all-star game emission list where they should have gone, but they didn't have the roster space to do so. Um, It also becomes difficult when you have a certain amount of players every single season who are going to go to the All-Star game regardless. There's always going to be McDavid and Dreisaitl going out of Edmonton, so that immediately takes up one of the extra spots for the Pacific Division. And suddenly it becomes difficult for Vegas to send all of their deserving players to the All-Star weekend. And it also makes it incredibly difficult for anyone else on the Oilers to even make it to the All-Star game because how are they going to outperform McDavid and Dreisaitl? If they have just a couple more extra spots, then it becomes a little bit easier for someone who's having a great season to get recognized for that. And then you also have situations like Colorado this season, where they could potentially have five-plus players going to the All-Star game, but they can only accommodate one or two. McKinnon, Landeskog, Rantanen, Kadri, Makar, and hell, even Devon Taves could make a case to go to the All-Star game. Like they could, they could send all of those players, but they can only send one or two in actuality because they just don't have the space to accommodate that on the roster. If they had more spots available on the rosters, they could send all of those abs, but also make sure that they still have a player from each team going. So ultimately, it it does make sense that the league wants to make sure that all the teams are represented in their All-Star weekend. It's fair. They want to make sure that all the fan bases are covered, that everyone's got a reason to tune in. But first off, they have to work on actually making the All-Star weekend appealing for people to watch, because quite frankly, it's not. And secondly, they can really just make a simple solution here of adding a few more roster spots to make more appropriate representation where each team can kind of send a couple of people if needed 
but those other spots can also just go to teams that are really performing well. That seems to be the most reasonable, logical, and easiest compromise so that the league can still send all the teams and the players and fans can have a best-on-best action. That wraps things up for this time here on Clappercast. Make sure you rate and review this episode and toss a follow or subscribe our way. For more content, you can follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Clappercast Media or on Twitter at Clappercast. Thank you all for tuning in, and we'll be back next week with more Hockey Talk.